start projects by going to the library and like digging throughout history books and looking at paintings that, that I admire that are interesting to me. And I start to think about, you know, what, what did painting mean at, at that point in history and what can it possibly mean nowadays? So I started stumbling sort of on the, on the work of the early California landscape painters, uh, the painters from the 1800s that came out from New York and they started painting these like grandiose landscape views of the, this virgin Western America. What was really striking to me about these works from the past was that they were all so optimistic about California. They were all this, this idea that you could come from the East on your horseback and arrive in California and strike it rich and dig the gold out of the ground and get the fruit off the trees and the weather was always perfect. And there's this whole idea that California was this American paradise. For several weeks I was reading about these paintings and looking at these paintings and thinking about them. And at some point I was just driving along in my car and on the radio I overheard it said that California has a higher percentage of its population in prison of anywhere on earth. And it was just this really striking sentence to me because I'd been so much thinking about California as this, this wonderful place. And then to find out 150 years later, after the gold rush, now it's the most incarcerated people on the planet. Um, the two ideas just really were jarring and sort of a shock. So I embarked on this mission to paint all the paintings <laughs> of the prisons. California has built more prisons since the 1980s than any other place in the world. Um, so it's a kind of epicenter. So there's statistics that we could tell people, like there are 2.3 million Americans behind bars and California has the most of them, but statistics have a kind of numbing abstraction and art does a different kind of work. Sando Burke is a painter and is working out of the landscape tradition. His work obviously um, takes on and redeploys a 19th century tradition of landscape painting. So he's commenting in this very wry way about this 19th century tradition that was selling the landscape then and is selling the landscape now in quite different ways. Early on, they, even the landscape paintings at that time were laden with more meaning than just pretty pictures, which was interesting to me. And then when I would go to see these prisons and look up where they are and drive out there and then I would do these sketches and take little photos and things and come back and do the paintings here in the studio. Um, often the, the prisons of today were located in places that I could actually find old paintings of that place, which was really ironic. Uh, behind us is Terminal Island Federal Correctional Facility. Um, I drove all around the harbor looking at it from different angles to see what I could see um, and put together a composition and did a painting of it. Several times I, I drove out to see prisons uh, and they would be way, way out in the desert with nothing around them, just flat and dirt and rocks. And it was really hard to come up with interesting compositions, but here, with the ships going by and the cranes and the, and the seagulls and everything. It was, there's a lot more interesting things to make an interesting painting. What can landscape painting be now in the 21st century? Is it still an interesting way to paint, an interesting genre of painting? Um, can landscape paintings be about more than just a pretty picture? So while the pictures were about prisons themselves, they're also about painting and the history of painting, I think. Elise does a much more kind of personal work with her installations that includes letters and, and very emotional work with individual photographs of prisoners. And with her work, she takes you inside. Inside, actually, not just into the prison, but into a genre that only prisoners, visitors, and guards normally see. About six years ago, I found a Polaroid photograph in a family photo album of myself at age five, with my sister visiting our older brother in Bayside State Prison in Leesburg, 
New Jersey, and this image, along with many other images that I found of my family members visiting my brother in prison, instantly captivated me because the backdrop, which represents freedom, was the exact opposite of the prison's mission and of the reality that my brother was living. And so I initially started the project by going, um, finding inmates to write letters to. And so I became pen pals with a few people, really as a way to, to learn more about the backdrops and how people related to the backdrop. My original idea was to, f for me to go inside prisons with my own camera and to photograph the backdrops and the, the painters who painted the backdrops. But then once I started these correspondences and inmates started sending me their own family photographs, when I received a few of these photographs, I realized that these images were the best documents of the system and that these images were more interesting than anything that I myself could create as an outsider. As an artist, my job has really been as sort of a documentarian to show this system that's happening of the inmates painting idealized landscape backdrops and inmates taking the pictures. The backdrops vary in size. Some are painted, like this is painted on parachute cloth, which is a fabric, so that the backdrop can be rolled up. So a prison will have several backdrops in storage, and throughout the year they could unroll different backdrops. But then a lot of backdrops are also just painted on a wall, like on the cinder block wall or whatever's there. Con confront viewers' biases and attitudes towards prisoners. I think that's what these images do. You know, even if someone is, is guilty, they're still a human being and they still have a family, especially the children who have parents in prison. These are the images that those children see of their, let's say, your father's in prison. This is the, this is the only image you have of your father. You know, I think that the, the loved ones of the incarcerated are the really are the collateral damage of the, of the prison system. There's a weird way that prisons are at once invisible and hyper-mediated. I mean, turn on the television, there's nothing you see more than prisoners. That Elise gives narratives that are so human, so daily, and, and so meaningful. Um, does a different kind of work than, say, Richard Ross, who uh, has no people at all in his images. They're these very particular kind of architectures of numbing sameness, of shackles, of chairs, of cages, devoid of people. It started with my kids' Montessori class, where they're all sitting on a circle, and allegedly everybody's equal. Then I looked at the United Nations Security Council, where everybody's equal. Schools, classrooms, religious institutions, and then it went to, well, where else can this be manifest? And certainly by the time I took it to Guantanamo, by the time I took it to Abu Ghraib, Pelican Bay, I was looking at a different aspect of that world. You find out that you are, your space isn't as an equal, your space isn't as an adversary, your space is as a prisoner. You start experience some of these dehumanizations and it become, you become much more uh, agitated in terms of changing what policy is going to be. You may not have the solution, but you understand that the protocol that's in place now is debilitating, dehumanizing, just wrong. This is probably the most horrific image that I've got. If you want to have something that you want to leave people with. This is Miami-Dade. 
And this is a wall of kids when they're put on house arrest or home release after they're let out of detention. They're sat down and somebody will say to them, these are your peers. And expired in this case doesn't mean that their driver's license expired. It means that they're dead and they're all dead by gunshot wounds. I did a piece about two months ago as part of the Juvenile Injustice series, which is more or less a sequel, Son of Architecture of Authority. So as part of that series, I spent 24 hours in an isolation cell, which is the default position for many juvenile institutions. It's a seven by 10 or an eight by 10 concrete room. You know very quickly as to where you are positioned within that room, it becomes even more codified for you when you have the freedom to use the toilet when you want, but you have to press a bell and request toilet paper when you want to clean yourself up. And even then you get maybe four sheets of toilet paper, so you know pretty quickly who's in charge.